We are studying one of the most important writings ever written for human minds, the book of Romans. We are at this point five lessons into the book and uh, being still in the first chapter of the book, we wish to study the nature of God as revealed in the book of Romans. Uh, in Romans, uh, the great apostle to the Gentiles named Paul made a remarkable presentation of the very nature of God. It would be easy to slip over it, just like reading matter, but it would be wrong to do that because, for example, in Romans 16 and 27, he said, to God only wise. <laughs> You'd have to study that a while, you see. Our Jehovah only wise. Now, the arrogance of the human mind would say that isn't true. There are a lot of other wisdom other than that but when you get to the fundamentals of it that whatever wisdom there is came from that that God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever and so it shows us something of the great nature of God in your point number one it says that God is a witness now I, I'm sure that many of us never even consider God being a witness to something and it says here God as a witness that's in Romans 1 and 9 for God is my witness he uses God as his witness God knows and I know and God is my witness that this matter is true this God who is my witness the same one that I serve with my spirit say spirit you see He's right doctrinally. I'm mean, glad that Paul was right doctrinally. Uh, that I serve with my spirit. It is your spirit that serves God. It is your spirit that is your relationship with God. Your spirit is your new born again nature that comes to you in the moment of rebirth. When you are born again, it is your spirit that comes alive within you. And then that spirit is your communication center between God and man. And so he is speaking here, I serve with my spirit. And how did he serve him with his spirit? In the gospel of his son. That is the way we come into the sonship of God through the good news that Jesus Christ died on Calvary, rose again, and that's the gospel. The gospel is the good news that Christ came, born of a virgin, walked among men as a man, that he healed the sick, that he fed the hungry, that he cast out devils, that he died on Calvary, that he rose again. This is the good news that man has today. And he says that I have God as my witness through Jesus Christ, his son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Now, that is a tremendous statement in that he said, God is the witness that I make mention of you in my prayers. And he says, now, I do this through the movement of being born again and have a new nature in Christ Jesus, God's Son. There, there, there is so much doctrine there. Some people don't even believe that God has a son. And if they do, they don't believe he has an only begotten son. And so there is embedded here a remarkable measure of truth for us to enjoy. God is the observer. That is in your point B there. God is an observer. He is watching everything that anyone does and that everyone does. The IBM is a toy to what God has. God understands the thoughts, not only of you, but of five billion others living at the same time. Who would like to have a job on the computer system in heaven? Well, one of the angels might let you in for, for the job that that they're enjoying so very much. God is an observer. He is watching everything that all of us do. And more than that, he knows what we think. He knows our motivations, what makes us and causes us to do certain things. We're motivated by something that is within us. 
if you give to someone, there has to be a motivation for that. If you take something from somebody, there has to be a motivation for that. So God understands the motivations, the things that cause us to do things that maybe we don't even understand our, ourselves. Our neighbors can only see what our eyes reflect. And man, that's a lot if we study human eyes. Of what our mouths say, and that's too much at times. Can you say amen? And what our hand movements reveal, whether they are angry or whether they're full of love and, and kindness, God goes further than any of these manifestations of personality. He, gives, he, he goes into the deepest recesses of the human spirit and becomes a witness to all that is there. The only one that can actually witness of what's in your spirit is God. He is a witness of what is going on in your spirit, your desires of reaching out to save the lost, your desires for being a better person. God is a witness to all these matters of the spirit. If you're glad for it, say amen. God sees why we do certain things and why we do not do certain other things. He is a witness to the things that we do and, and, and he understands them. The witness of God is always correct. Uh, sometimes we have to take information and we only get a part of the information. This last week we had information that came to us and, and I, was, I was very touched by it and come to find out the information was wrong. And I, and I was really glad <laughs> that it was wrong. And you, but it, uh, sometimes you and I are fed either poor information, wrong information, or half, half information. God has the total amount. How many are glad for that? God knows you like nobody else knows you. And even like you don't know you, God knows you. The parts of you that you haven't studied yet, God knows all about it. He's right there. And, and so how wonderful it is to have this relationship with the Most High God. The witness of God is correct. Uh, God, God's witness is eternal. Uh, sometimes we witness one thing today, we witness another thing tomorrow, we witness another thing. But the witness of God it stands immutable. There it is. It, it's correct. It's right. It's unchangeable. And, and how glad we are that when God has a feeling about a thing, his feelings are not like a wave on a sea. His feelings are the same as they've always been. You know, sometimes we change our minds. We say, now, this is a sin. A little later, we tamper with it, and we say, well, maybe it's not a sin. <laughs> God hasn't changed his man, mind about it. That's just you. Uh, yeah, you just have a different feeling about it. I had a preacher friend that, that, that one of his biggest sermons was against divorce. Almost every time he got in a pulpit, he wailed away at it. He had three children to get, to, to, to get grown and, 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 uh, and, and to get married, and, and, and they all divorced. And I asked him if his sermon was still holding up. And he said, no, so I don't preach on that anymore. I says, well, you think God changed his mind about it too? He says, I wouldn't know at all, but I sure changed mind about it. When it's in your family, it's different, he said. How many think you're going to write a Bible about what's in your family? Wouldn't that be something? We're going to write a Bible according to your family of what your kids did. You're going to have to have truth bedded upon the eternal rock of God that cannot be shaken or moved. Truth is truth. Whoever loves it or whoever violates it, it doesn't change truth. And all the people said, so we have God as our witness, and it's really our security because his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, is our advocate before him. And so we have a dual blessing there. If you make a mistake and you do something wrong, the Bible says we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the Son. And, and God already knows about it. And our advocate comes and pleads for us. How many are glad you got an advocate? That's a lawyer. You got a lawyer talking for you on your side. Now, that is your point. God is a witness. And your second one, God is uncorruptible. That is a very beautiful thing. It's in Romans 1, 23. And, and this is an indictment against those that have changed the laws of nature and, and the laws of God and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man. Uh, he showed you how paganism began. Some people say, oh, paganism, uh, it, it goes so far back into the past until, uh, until really 
well, it all began with God, and we're all going to God. Now, that lie came out of hell, and that lie came from the devil. All paganism, all paganism is in direct rebellion to the Most High God. I had a witch doctor in Africa to tell me personally. He said, yes, I know there's a greater God, but I'm scared of him, and so I use the lesser gods to get to him. And those lesser gods of his were the ugliest creatures you've ever seen in your life. They were devils. And he said he had seen them in the spirit world and he had carved them. And they were awful, 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 terrible, terrible looking creatures. And he was worshiping those because he was afraid to get to the big God, he called him, over on the other side. Well, I want to assure you that you cannot change the glory of the uncorruptible God. You can try to by creating images made like into corruptible man and images made like birds, images made like four-footed beasts, images of creeping things. But our God will have no relationship to those things because they are not true and they are not honest. Can you say amen? That, that, that is absolutely true. And if you're not careful, your, your, your little God can be the job you have. It can be the house you live in or the car you drive. Anything that comes between you and God is a God. But you want to remember that God will not become part of those things. He is uncorruptible. You cannot shift him around. You cannot make him this or that or the other. He's not a God of one people and not of another people. He is not a God that you can say, now, now let's cheat a little today, God. He is, no, no, I'm the same as I was yesterday. I'm not in the cheating business. And so he is the God who is uncorruptible. And how glad we are that we can worship such a one that he cannot be corrupted. They say that money will corrupt anybody, that if you get enough money, you'll corrupt any human person. Our God cannot be corrupted by anything on this earth because he made the earth anyway, and he cannot be corrupted by it. If you're glad for it, say amen. We live in a corrupt world. This is the top of page 25. We live in a corrupt world that is full of disintegration, falling to pieces. We live in a corrupt world full of evil, full of dead matter of all kinds. And, and uh, we, 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 we serve a God that's not part of that. He is a God that cannot be corrupted, has never known corruption, has never known any form of death whatsoever. Everything he touches lives forever. He is the uncorruptible God, and we have him in our hearts. There has, there has never lived a person, man or woman, except the Lord Jesus Christ on this earth who we would call uncorruptible. When you, when, you study, when you study all the human persons in the Bible, you find that they all had clay feet. Whether they were, whether, whether they were a man like Moses, there was a time he missed God. Of whether he was a person like Elijah, there was a time where he missed God. Man in his physical form can be corrupted, but God in his almightiness cannot be corrupted. And we're glad that we're serving such a God. Let's go to point number three. You can read the one there regarding, regarding divorce, where we break down the fabric of society, when we break the covenants that we make. God is a covenant-keeping God and will never break any covenant he has ever made with man. And your point number three, God is impartial. We like that because there's so many people that feel that God is partial to other people. And, and, and that's a, a lie the devil tells you. You know, the devil has told you that. God has not told you that. The devil has told you. Now, some, some parents are even partial to their own children. They treat one child more better than they do another child and so forth. But God has never known partiality. Well, you said, how about the Jews? No, God is not partial to the Jews. There was a man named Abraham that won an estate that God gave to him, and his children are enjoying that estate today, and you can create such a thing with God that he has to bless your children because you have a special relationship with God. That is not partiality. Jesus did not show partiality when John laid his head over on his shoulder. The other disciples said, oh, now look at John. He's laying his head over on Jesus' shoulder. Well, all you've got to know is the same shoulder belonged to everybody. Every one of them could have had their term on the shoulder, and you didn't have to get angry at the fellow that was using the shoulder. 
Are you here? There's some people that feel that way about the pastor. They say, well, now the pastor, he likes this person more than the other person. Well, the pastor's not to blame if somebody moves in him and shows more affection toward him than you do. Icebergs are not very affectionate. Ask your husband. Anyway, in Romans 2 and 12, for as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. They won't be brought into grace and said, now what did you do about Jesus? I've told you before that in the conscience, in the conscience of every human is right and wrong. There's never been a human on the face of this earth that doesn't know right and wrong. In the middle of India, where they, where they may have 10,000 little villages, and nobody has ever said a word about Jesus in one of those villages. Everybody in those villages knows it's wrong to steal. They know it's wrong to lie. They know it's wrong to commit adultery. They know all the commandments. And the Bible says those people will be judged by that. God is a good judge. Can you say amen? And as many <coughs> as have sinned in the law, they should be judged by the law. That's just what I finished telling you. And that is in the, in the Bible. It's in Romans chapter 2 and verse 12. In the law, in the law courts of our world today, if two boys are on trial and one of those boys do not have as much as a dollar to fight his case in court. And if the other boy had a million dollars behind him because of a wealthy family, do you think, do you think they'll both go free? Not in, not in the world that we live in today. Money is a force and money is a power. And also, uh, and also families. You let a man be great and, and you read it in the newspapers and their children do wrong, it's very easy for them to get off. Are you here? No, no, a poor person wouldn't get off. You say, well, that's unequal. Ever since sin came to the world, things have been unequal. Sin is a creator of inequalities. And all the inequalities in the world go back to sin and not back to God. Say, praise the Lord, everybody. What a God we have. He is not partial from one, from one to another. Uh, I saw partiality. I've seen it all over the world. But in your point number C, when I went through 5,000 miles of Siberia and Russia, I rode on a train that had three classes on it. Now, now in, a, in a country that's supposed to have no class, uh, I, it had three classes on the train. I lived on there for 10 days. I happen to know all about the place. I rode in the, what was called the first class. It wasn't very first, I can assure you that. Uh, it, but, but I rode where all the tourists had to ride in order to... To, to go through there, you paid in advance for, for your travel and for your food and for everything. That was paid in advance. You didn't have to, when you went to the dining room, you didn't have to pay more money. Uh, if you were on the train, your food was provided because you'd already, already paid for it. And they called it first class, but that's where the tourists were. And then the army, the army also rode on the train. And they had a first class section to themselves. All the military were together with very fine accommodations. Businessmen had another such class. I presume they weren't in, in, in uniform. But the Russian people, the common people, they rode in the back section of this train, and I went back and looked at it. We went through there in February. It was 70, 70 degrees below zero. They had absolutely no heat of any kind, and they hovered around a little charcoal burner, putting their fingers over it and setting their feet up close to it. And there they were, and they didn't have seats uh, going this way. They, they had something like an old rail, and they, they was set on the rail with their backs to each other, and in front of them were, were, were these little burners. It was about as primitive as a railroad could be. And, and, they, and they say that communism, the appeal of communism is all men are equal, you see. But you go to communist countries, and it's not so. And I have been to communist countries of recent months, of recent months, and I just want to tell you something, it don't work. It doesn't work because man was not made to be that. Man was made, man was made to be an individual and to make his own way in life. And you can't make him a cog in a wheel because man is not a cog in a wheel. Man is an individual and God made him that way. And I hope we, we know that there are people in Washington that would like to turn this nation into a socialist country. 
into a socialist nation and, and say that we all are equal. We're not all equal. We've got a lot of lazy bums that won't work, and that's not equal to a man working about 14 to 16 hours a day because he just loves to work. Went over like a lead balloon, didn't it? God is impartial to the whole of the human race. God loves everybody. If you know that, say amen. Your fourth point, God is a judge. In Romans 2 and 16, it says, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. And then in Romans 3 and 6, it says, God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? Finally, God and his Son will judge all human persons from Adam to the Antichrist. Everyone will be judged, and they will not be judged by imperfect man. They will actually be judged by God and his chief, his chief administrator, which will be the Lord Jesus Christ. And so how glad we are that when we fall into the hands of God, we fall into the hands of equity, and we fall in the hands of truth, and we fall in the hands of one who, who cares. Can you say amen? So God is a judge. Uh, he is a God of all men. We've just been telling you that. And in Romans 3, 29, says he's not a God of the Jews. He's the God of the nations. The word Gentile means nations. God is patient. Let's get into some of the natures of God. In Romans 15 and 5, Now the God of patience and consolation grant unto you uh, that you be like-minded. God is a patient God. How many are glad that God is patient with us? Hey, I am so glad God is patient with me, and I, I appreciate it more and more every day of my life. And your point number seven, God is a God of hope. Now, now, now that, that is a very strong statement. It's in Romans 15 and 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound, that you may abound in hope through the power of of the Holy Ghost. I think that would make a tremendous text that God is a God of hope and he tries to put hope within us. We're living in a world that doesn't have much hope today. We live in a world, if you had AIDS today, your hope is at zero. Your hope is at zero. In a country that I have been in in, in recent weeks, there's not one barber in the whole nation that can shave you. Or not, nor can he use a razor on the back of your neck when he cuts your hair because of AIDS. They told me that two-thirds of the barber shops in the great capital city uh, had gone out of business. Now, 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 that's living without hope. That is living without hope. I'm glad that we can hope in God. I'm glad that God is a God of hope. And that God of, that God of hope can put hope on the inside of us. Can you say Amen. Our God gives hope and joy, and we say thank you, God, for it in Jesus' name. Your point number eight, God is also a God of peace. In Romans 15 and 33, now the God of peace be with you. God doesn't like controversy. God doesn't like anger. Uh, God doesn't like war. All war is of the devil. All fighting is of the devil. The only time that God ever comes against something is because it's sin. It's transgression. He hates transgression because it breaks down the fabric of the universe. It destroys what made the universe, and he has to come against it. But God is a God that's called the God of love. And I'm glad that in him is the very essence of every good and perfect thing. And all the people said, he is a God of peace. In Philippians 4 and 7, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through the Holy Ghost. He is also called, in number nine, he is the only wise God. To God, only wise, only wise. He is a God of joy, he is a God of strength, and he is a God of wisdom. And now, the best thing about him is this. Uh, he is our God. <laughs> Hallelujah. He is our God. We're not talking about one 40 million miles away. He is our God, and we can praise him from the depths of our heart, saying, we know in whom we have believed, and that he has changed us and transformed us and made us 
to be his children. If you're glad for it, say amen. amen. Our God is a God that cares for every need that you have. 